Hello health champions, today I want to talk about the shocking truth regarding eggs and heart disease. There is a prevailing truth, an accepted truth in mainstream medicine and in our society as a whole that cholesterol is bad, that saturated fat is bad, that saturated fat increases cholesterol and that's why saturated fat is bad and also that high levels of cholesterol causes heart disease. And then basically we've been told this so many times that we don't question it anymore, that the case is closed, this is how it is. And we're going to talk about all of these different factors and we're going to talk about it in a way that you learn to think about it, not just refer to some study or some article, but you'll understand these things and when you think about them you'll be able to go, hey, that makes sense or that does not make sense. But how come this became the prevailing truth, the mainstream truth, the current dogma? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we associate things, that these fatty plaques have some cholesterol in them and therefore we think, hey, that must come from somewhere, it must be from what we're eating, it must be the cholesterol. And a lot of that thinking had to do with something called the Seven Countries Study. So this was late 50s, early 60s, where a guy called Ansel Keys, who was a nutritionist, was very convincing in his arguments. So here is how that study came about. He studied number of countries. And as you soon notice, there were a lot more than seven countries. And in fact, there were 22 countries that he started with. And then you would think this should be called the 22 countries study, but he selected a number of these countries. So these were the only countries that ended up in the study, which is five of them. And then the other countries were scrapped because they didn't fit what he was looking for. So he was, had this idea that he was trying to prove that diets high in saturated fat and cholesterol in countries where they had those diets they also had more heart disease so he had to pick the countries that matched what he was trying to prove and that was only five countries out of 22 that matched his criteria and then he had to go and find two more countries greece and yugoslavia so now he had seven countries where he could kind of see a pattern and that's what he published as the seven country study. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that cherry picking like that is not a great idea if you want to be objective. But even so, this has been hailed as a landmark study and is basically the foundation of why we think the way we do today. And since then, there's been hundreds of studies performed on these topics and they tend to kind of fall 50-50 or in, in two opposite camps, not necessarily equally split, but there are some studies that prove, that show that high cholesterol is strongly correlated with cardiovascular disease. But for every study that says that, there is another that says there, there's no correlation or even an inverse correlation that actually high cholesterol, high saturated fat diets result in less cardiovascular disease. And that's why he had to scrap most of those 22 countries because a lot of them actually showed the opposite relationship. But why is it so difficult to figure this out? If we have gold standard research, double blind placebo control, why can't they figure it out? And one thing that we have to ask is who pays for it? And these studies are not cheap. They are in the millions or tens of millions of dollars to perform a big, comprehensive, well-designed study. So if you have tens of millions of dollars sitting around, you can go and order yourself a study and someone will be happy to perform it for you. But for the most part, the people or the companies with that kind of money tend to be pharmaceutical companies. So they have huge budgets because it's in their best interest to prove that high cholesterol causes heart disease. 
But here's an astounding fact that most people don't realize, but it kind of makes sense if you understand human nature. We don't want to look bad. So if someone orders a study and they get the results back and they're favorable, then there's an 85% chance that their studies will get published. If they can get it through the peer review process to show that it's well designed and relevant, then 85% of those will get published. But if it is not favorable, if the results coming back do not support what they wanted, then there's an 85% chance that it won't get published. And these are not totally exact numbers because it's going to vary a little bit, but they're roughly in the ballpark. And what this shows us is that what we call scientific truth, that we base this on double-blind placebo-controlled studies and we think, hey, what's out there, what's published, that represents the truth. But what's built into this process is a 45x bias toward the person who ordered, the entity who ordered the study. So we can't just look at what's out there and assume that that's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So I don't have tens of millions of dollars sitting around either. So I have performed some of my own studies on a smaller scale. And you may have seen those videos where I do something, I get some blood work, then I eat something, and then I do blood work again, and then I report what happened. So for example, I ate 100 eggs in seven days, and the pre and post blood work showed a few items going up or down, but overall I did not get sicker. There were no dramatic markers that I had a poor health after doing that. Then another time I ate 100 tablespoons of butter in 10 days. And interestingly, you would think that all that saturated fat would end up in my bloodstream as triglycerides, but my triglycerides went down and my insulin resistance improved after doing that. I ate 100 hamburgers in 10 days, or rather 100 hamburger patties, because I didn't want to eat a bunch of bread and carbohydrate to screw up my metabolism. And interestingly, my cholesterol went from 233 to 199, which is one of the lowest ones I have had in recent decades. And I don't really know why. I thought it would stay pretty much the same. And another interesting thing was the blood urea nitrogen, the bun, which went from 16 to 10, even though I ate almost twice as much protein as I usually do. And the residue from protein is this nitrogen that we can measure in blood urea nitrogen. And when I mentioned in that video that I wasn't sure why that bun went down, and I still don't. One of my viewers enlightened me and said, of course it went down because you ate the hamburger without the bun. And if you notice, I put quotation marks around the word studies because I do that kind of tongue in cheek. I don't believe that these are good examples of research. This is actually pretty bad science, and I'm not claiming that it's anything else, and the reason is that the total sample population, meaning the number of people studied, is exactly one, namely myself. And it still costs a few hundred bucks to do that. So the reason it's not great science is that I may not be like you. Whatever results I get could be different than yours, but I'm not claiming that it's good science or that I represent you. But guess what? When they do bigger studies, if they have a study with 10,000 people in them, and then they have 55% of people respond a certain way, that's gonna create a trend. It's gonna be statistically significant probably, even though 4,500 people out of the 10,000 didn't respond that way. And I'm just making coarse, gross examples here to illustrate something. But the point is that it doesn't matter how big the study is, it may still not be like you, okay? So you still have to figure out you. And the way that you do that is in these videos, I explain the mechanisms and the basic physiology so you can start understanding how the body works 
rather than just looking at one example, whether it's mine or somebody else's. And then you can look at your own blood work or you could look at your own results in life, how you feel, your weight, your waistline, etc. And then you figure you out. But you can't do that unless you understand some mechanisms and some basic physiology. Let's look at some very simple facts. Eggs have cholesterol. Eggs have saturated fat. But the question then is, first, if we eat a bunch of eggs, does this mean that we raise our blood cholesterol? We don't know. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But if it did go up, would that be a bad thing? And here's the huge misconception that a lot of people think if it goes up, then that's bad. But in itself, it doesn't mean anything. We have to look at the bigger picture. Now let's take a look at the concept of conversion, of turning one thing into another. Because based on the prevailing truth about eggs, cholesterol, saturated fat, and heart disease, as a culture, we believe that dietary cholesterol leads to plaques, leads to atherosclerosis. So let's take a, an example. Let's make a comparison. So here we have an egg, which has obviously cholesterol. And then we have this theory that this leads to placking and atherosclerosis and narrowing of arteries. And this is basically how we think based on these studies, the seven country studies, that the cholesterol from here ends up as cholesterol in the plaque. It's the same cholesterol, more of this leads to more of that. But here is a question. Now, if we assume that maybe this isn't true, maybe there's some conversion going on. And let's ask a question that if in another example that we have a cow and this cow has a body with some fat in it with some saturated fat with cholesterol in the fat this cow produces milk from which we can make butter that has lots of fat, lots of saturated fat, lots of cholesterol. So if this cow is full of cholesterol, where did that come from? Is it because that cow ate a bunch of eggs with cholesterol? Did it eat a bunch of butter with cholesterol? Did it eat a bunch of meat? Does it go around eating the other cows? Is that how the cholesterol ends up in the cow? No, if this cow eats what it's supposed to, then all it eats is grass. Green grass, pure carbohydrates, basically. It has a trace amount of protein and, uh, and fat in it. But basically, this cow eats things, eats grass that has no cholesterol, and yet it ends up with all that cholesterol in the body. So maybe if we understand that there's a conversion process, maybe that cholesterol in the plaque doesn't come from there. That's a possibility. And this conversion is also known as metabolism, which means to transform. So it's a form of transformation. So if we look at the things that we eat as humans, and we are, by the way, quite similar to a cow in that we are both mammals, we both store fat, and we store it as about half saturated and about half monounsaturated. That's typical for the body fat of both a cow and a human. So the big groups, the big macronutrients that we eat are protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And protein, the purpose is to turn into tissue, to building blocks, to body parts, but the excess will actually turn into carbohydrates. And carbohydrates, in turn, can become fat, but it can't work the other way around. So we can convert things sometimes one way, but not necessarily both ways. And then all three of these, 
turn into something called acetyl-CoA. And don't worry about the name, don't try to memorize any of this. I'm just trying to show you that we have something called conversion, metabolism, transformation. We eat these things and along the way they become something else. This is an intermediary metabolite that we use to make energy. So if we make energy from protein, carbs, or fat, it's because we can turn it into acetyl-CoA. But if we're really, really low on carbs, this acetyl-CoA can turn into something else, depending on circumstances, depending on what's appropriate for the body, what it needs at that time. So if we're low on carbs, we can turn this acetyl-CoA into ketones. And this acetyl-CoA is also the raw material for cholesterol. So again, I'm just trying to show you that this cholesterol didn't necessarily come from cholesterol, that we can turn anything that we eat can turn into cholesterol if we need it. But here's the thing, it's really not a mystery anymore. Today we know what the cause of cardiovascular disease is, and it is chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and something called insulin resistance. I'm not going to go into depth here because I've done videos on all of this. And it's also something called metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. And this is a label, this is a concept. When we're metabolically unhealthy, then we have certain manifestations. And if we have abdominal obesity, hypertension, meaning high blood pressure, if we have high fasting glucose, if your body can't control blood glucose, as in type 2 diabetes, if we have high triglyceride, high blood fats, also very common in diabetes, if we have low HDL, the supposedly good cholesterol, which of course there is no good or bad, there's just appropriate and appropriate cholesterol, then if you have any three out of these five, then they consider you to have metabolic syndrome. And then they know that you'll be predisposed to all these different problems of, of heart disease, etc. But the people with metabolic syndrome, what they really have is chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. So these three things are the causes that we need to work on and that we need to control. And this is very, very well established. There's really no discussion or controversy about this at all. What there still is controversy about is which type of foods and what type of lifestyle will create these states that cause cardiovascular disease. But the question now in this video is, do eggs cause cardiovascular disease? So the question is, do eggs cause these three things? And the answer is, no, they don't. There is nothing in there that causes insulin resistance or oxidative stress or inflammation. Unless you are allergic to them, then that becomes a bad food for you. Or if you combine the eggs with things like sugar, margarine, and chemicals. And this is the problem with a lot of the observational studies like the seven country studies that he picked countries that had a high intake of saturated fat and cholesterol but what else did they eat did they eat a bunch of sugar margarine and chemicals how much did they smoke do they ever exercise we don't know but here's what we do know high total cholesterol in itself does not cause heart disease and here's an article that i have referenced once before but it's so good i want to bring it back so basically they looked at the total cholesterol levels. They only measured two things. They measured total cholesterol and how many people died. And this was a huge study because they did this in Korea over a decade or so. And it was basically everyone in Korea, more or less. So 12.8 million adults were part of this study. And it's not like the seven country studies where they don't know all the variables because here they were only interested in two. They didn't care what else they did. They only looked at what happens with cholesterol and how many people die. Of all the people who died, what were their cholesterol levels? So they looked at 12.8 million adults and they looked at all-cause mortality. So what that means is they didn't really care if the cholesterol caused heart disease or not. 
all they know, because you could maybe save a few people from heart disease, but if they die faster from something else, then that's not really a gain, is it? So all-cause mortality is pretty much what we're interested in. And here's the interesting thing that they found, that we're told that high cholesterol is bad, low cholesterol is good. And they give people statin drugs. I've had people come through my office on statin drugs with a cholesterol under 120. And they keep giving them the statin drug as if less is always better. But here's what we find on this graph is that low cholesterol is really, really bad. Like really low cholesterol is really bad. And if we compare that to very high cholesterol, we see that a cholesterol of, of 110, 120 is many, many times worse, much more likely to cause death than a cholesterol of 300. But when was the last time you saw a commercial for a medication to raise cholesterol? It's like, oh my God, your cholesterol is 120. We got, you get, we got to get you up into the 250s. They don't do that so much, do they? Because we have this bad idea that less is always better. And in fact, what we found in this study was that the sweet spot, the absolute lowest death rate, the optimal cholesterol would fall somewhere around 230. And if we looked at the area where they had a very slight increase above the lowest rate of death, like less than 10% increase above that lowest rate, we would consider that a pretty good, pretty good odds, then that gives us a pretty wide range where we are safe. So anywhere from 180 to 270 is a very slight increase in risk. And then if we overlap that with the standard range, with the normal recommendations that we get all over the world, is that the cutoff is at 200. Anything over 200 is too high and you should take medication to control it. And if you notice here that what the study found to be the optimal range where you have just a slight increase falls almost entirely in the red area where you would be prescribed or recommended medication or lifestyle changes or both to lower your cholesterol. Now let's just add one more factor to this because I think it's a great study, but remember they only look at the total cholesterol and the total amount of death, all cause mortality. But what we have to realize is that some of these people with high cholesterol were healthy and some of them were very unhealthy. And the other things that we just talked about that we know cause heart disease, that some of these people had those factors and some didn't. So what if we were to take this population, and I'm speaking hypothetically now, and we took all the people with abdominal obesity and we took them out of here because we're trying to find out how does cholesterol affect death. If we now correct for the people who had abdominal obesity, which we know is a risk factor, and we also take out the people who have hypertension and high fasting glucose, high triglycerides and low HDL, we know these are risk factors for heart disease. Let's take these people out. So now we isolate more for what cholesterol in itself actually does. And we also correct, we take the people out who have high insulin levels. Now we have a pure population where only cholesterol is a causative factor of death. And I believe, not that I've ever known that they've done this study, but I very strongly believe that if we corrected for this, then the curve would look like that. It would be almost flat. And I don't know, maybe around five, six, seven, eight hundred total cholesterol that it might go up for some other reason. But I think the majority of people with cholesterol in the three to four hundred range, if we correct for this, which we can control through lifestyle, then we will not have an increased risk from cholesterol. And please hear me when I say that I'm not suggesting that 350 is any better than 250. What I am saying, the number of total cholesterol by itself is not what we wanna look at.
Now let's just go back to the actual causes that we talked about and see why do they cause heart disease or why is part of the reason. So when we have insulin resistance, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and poor metabolic health, what happens in the body is that the LDL changes. It's not that LDL is bad, but we can change LDL into something bad if we have these factors present because LDL is normally relatively large. I call it large and fluffy. That's how your liver produces it, large and fluffy. It actually comes from even larger uh, lipoproteins that, that shrink down and then if they're healthy, they kind of fall into this range. But if we have these factors, these destructive factors present in the body, then they hurt, they damage these LDL particles and they shrink. So now this inflammation causes damage to the inside of your blood vessels, plus it makes these small LDLs unrecognizable. You can't recycle them properly and they're small enough to go to the wrong places and create damage. So what I have found in clinical cases, we have done hundreds of these, we do blood work on everyone, we test the size of these in everyone, so we can follow up and see what the changes are. And when we put people on a lifestyle change where they eat no sugar and no seed oils, no processed damaged vegetable oils, we give them a high quality diet, meaning good quality meat, fish, chicken, good quality vegetables, low carb vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. And we combine that with intermittent fasting, meaning we restrict their feeding window so they don't eat every hour of every day. We feed them meat, vegetables, and yes, eggs, unless, they are sensitive to eggs, then we take them out. And we also give them high quality fats. We give them extra virgin olive oil, lots of butter, lard, tallow, coconut oil, etc. Stable saturated fats, plus of course, extra virgin olive oil, which is mostly mono unsaturated. Then what we find is we measure these sizes before and after and we find that it goes the other way. That by making these lifestyle changes, you reduce the inflammation and the oxidative stress and the insulin resistance. And now the body can start to slowly cycle out, clean out these small damaged LDLs. And then the body, as it makes new and healthy ones, then the proportion of these small ones get fewer and fewer, less and less proportion. But then of course the question is, does that always work? Does this work 100% of the time? And the answer is no, nothing works 100% of the time. And I put only here kind of as a joke because 90 to 95% is sensational. And yet that is kind of where we're, where we're getting. Maybe not in the first couple of months, maybe not the first time around, for a lot of people, probably two thirds to 75%, they get dramatic changes like the first time through. But for others, we might have to play around with it and figure out what they're sensitive to. Is there an autoimmunity thing? Is there other things causing inflammation? But we need to put this in perspective, the only 90 to 95%, because there's something called placebo. And in a double blind, can placebo-controlled study, they always have different groups. And they give one group a placebo, meaning something that looks like it's gonna do something, but there's nothing in there. There's no active component in there. And yet, the placebo group always gets somewhere around 35% improvement. 35% of people notice improvement, even though they didn't get anything. So 35% is kind of the baseline. That's what you get no matter what, because when people believe that they're gonna get better, they get better. And a success medication only has to be better than placebo. 
So if it's a very large study, all they have to show is that it's statistically significant that it's better than placebo. So one or two or three or five percent maybe better than placebo and that's a sensational success for a medication. And if a medication can show maybe a 40% improvement, then they are super happy with that. That's a sensational result. But we, of course, are not happy with 40%. So we try to always get as close to 100 as we can. So now we want to start looking at other sources of inflammation. And this is where it gets tricky because now it gets a little more complicated and a little bit more individual variation. But there are things like allergies, there is other toxicity, there is autoimmunity, and of course, gut issues. If you have inflammation in the gut, if you have poor absorption, if you have leaky gut, now we have lots of variables that might be hard to control, at least in the short term, that start affecting these numbers. But if we're patient enough and we're willing to continue to make changes and monitor blood work and, and check on these, then very often we can get to 98, 99%. And that doesn't mean necessarily complete remission or that there are no symptoms left, but that we are much better off than we were. And then there is that last one to 2%. And this is very unfortunate, but some people are just given some bad cards that there are various genetic factors that if you do all the things we talked about, you're still going to be way better off, but that may still not be enough. So the shocking truth about eggs and heart disease is that you have been lied to. We have all been lied to for much too long. For decades, they have been focusing all their attention on the wrong guy. They've been demonizing the hero because it's not about total cholesterol. It's not about dietary cholesterol. It's not about saturated fats or how many eggs you eat. It is about metabolic health and all the factors that go into that, like insulin, toxicity, gut health, and the list goes on and on. And that's why we need to understand more about how the body works and how the world has changed because the world has changed more in the last 50 years than it has in the previous 50,000. And we need to understand how does that affect us so that we don't just walk like lambs to the slaughter. So the solution is learn what real food is and eat that. And this includes eggs, as many as you like. Make sure to get good quality eggs, get the pastured eggs, and eat both the yolk and the egg white, unless you have been found to be sensitive or allergic to eggs, because then they're gonna create inflammation and then they're bad for you. So everyone is different. Learn what works for you, but understand it from the mechanisms and the physiology. If you enjoyed this video, you're gonna love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.